Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time today to uh, give towards and devote towards worship. We do have a few announcements before we get started. First, uh, you'll notice that this isn't where I'm usually standing. I'm usually up there. I'm changing the recording setup a bit um, to try to get a little bit better sound. So we'll try this. Usually there's a little bit of a background buzz, and I think uh, by doing this I'll be able to eliminate it. Uh, some notes about what's happening coming up here. Uh, we're coming up on Holy Week, uh, on the week that runs up to Easter, Easter being on April 4. The um, Thursday and Friday before that, that Thursday is Monday Thursday, the celebration of when uh, Jesus gathers with the disciples for a meal, and I believe we're going to gather for a meal as well. And so the plan right now is uh, I'll make corned beef. Again, I made corned beef for the church. That was the last meal we shared together at Shalbina, and I'll make it again. We'll have some fixings for uh, people who don't enjoy corned beef, even though I'm not quite sure how you couldn't enjoy corned beef because it, it's amazing, uh, but life. Um, then on Good Friday, uh, we'll have a, a moment of worship uh, in here in the church in the sanctuary. Both Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday will be at 6 p.m. Also, in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at restarting our uh, Sunday school for children, as well as uh, potentially going outside for worship as well. Uh, it is simply easier for families with young children to be able to go to worship outside, and I, I think that would be a very important thing. So those are our announcements for this morning. We're beginning a, a series looking at like, how the Old Testament moves us towards Easter. And so we're beginning this series uh, today by looking at a, a reading out of Genesis, the story of Noah and the covenant that Noah makes, uh, Adam makes, God makes with Noah. This is Genesis 9. And God said to Noah and to his sons with him, And I, I am about to establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the fowl and the cattle and every beast of the earth with you, all that have come out of the ark, every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I set between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For everlasting generations, my bow I have set in the clouds to be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And so when I send the clouds over the earth, the bow will appear in the cloud. Then I will remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters will no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will see it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures, all the flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And God said, that is how this, this conversation begins, this conversation between God and Noah. And yet, as we read this, it becomes very clear that it is a very one-sided conversation. If, if you kind of listen to how it's unfolding, like God makes a statement and you expect Noah to say something in response and Noah doesn't, right? It happens three times here. And God said, and, and, and God lays out something and Noah should respond. Like, here's your pause, but he doesn't. And, so, and then God said, and we hear the next part of that. It's, like that. it's like when you're trying to explain something to another person and you get done explaining it and you expect them to say, oh, that makes sense. And, and they don't say anything and they just look at you like you're speaking Swahili. Like that's kind of how I imagine this happening. Like this, and God spoke to laying out this promise that's gonna happen, laying out this, this commitment that uh, there's gonna be this, this relationship between God and all, pe all creatures that draw breath, that um, this relationship between God and all the creatures will be that there will no, never again be a flood upon all the earth. And at this point, God stops speaking and Noah doesn't say anything. 
And then God says some more and gives the details. Okay, well, let me tell you about the details of this. The, I am putting my bow up. So I'm putting my bow up. And so every time you see my bow in the sky after the clouds, you will know that's a sign of this commitment that I'm making. I put the bow up. I'm not going to draw the bow again. And again, Noah doesn't respond. And finally, God like wraps it up and says, okay, and this is the sign of my covenant. Sort of like summarizes it one more time. And again, Noah doesn't have anything to say. And so let, let's leave Noah for a minute because he, while he's struggling to try to figure out what, what's happening, and, and let's consider what we're hearing ourselves. Let, let's consider what, uh, there are two aspects of this commitment that I think are important for us to, to key in on. First, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve and humanity is set upon the earth, they are commanded to keep and to till the land. In this context, like looking at the way that God has kept and taken care of an Adam and Eve, it's pretty clear that the command for Adam and Eve to take care of the land is a sort of a parallel thing. Like the way that I, God, have taken care of you, Adam and Eve, that's how you are to take care of the land. Like you care for it in the way that I have cared for you. And this line of thought continues here, like that now that... Um, God has cared for Adam and Eve and humanity and for Noah. Now this, this, this care is going to be extended to all of uh, the, all the creatures that draw breath. Like, I, I God, am making commitment to all the creatures that draw breath. It's not just you, Noah. It's not just all your descendants, Noah. It is all the creatures on the earth that, that you can name. All, all of these creatures, they will be part of this commitment as well. I will not wipe them out with the waters of a flood. Now, this is not to say that uh, God is commanding them to be vegetarian all of a sudden. It, it, this is also the chapter in which God says, and anything that's living, you can eat, right? So God makes a commitment not to wipe out the chickens via the flood, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't eat chicken. Uh, that, that's still, they're still pretty tasty. Right? So this is a, a long-term commitment that God is make, making to all the creatures, uh, all, all, both humanity and all creatures that draw breath upon the earth. The second part of this commitment that I, I think is impressive is the uh, concrete nature of, of what, what you can look to as a sign of this, right? God says, I'm putting my bow up. I'm putting it up in a way, and you'll be able to see it in the sky after it rains. You know, I am not using the word rainbow, I'm using the word bow, because rainbow, as far as I know, doesn't exist. That word doesn't exist in ancient Hebrew. And even if it does, it is distinctly not the word that is used here. The word that is used here is bow, as in bow and arrow, as in a weapon, a weapon that you use uh, to attack, right? The, uh, if you go back into these ancient times, before the sword is being used, the first things that are around to be able to be used to, to cause pain or hunt or hurt another person would be a pointy stick, a flint rock or a sharpened rock or something, or a bow and arrow. And so to put the bow up is a commitment not to uh, use violence, to put up the bow and not draw it again. Looking at the nature of this commitment, helps us make sense of why Noah is struggling with this so much. Well, first Noah is, might be struggling with this because he's just gone through this horrifying event. The flood is often like toned down and tamed and made into toys for children to play with, the little stuffed animals that you put in a boat and, and then put on walls and used to decorate. And that, that's, that's a great way to introduce people, young children, to the story of Noah. But we also need to acknowledge as adults thinking about this story that um, it would have been horrifying, right? If you think about all the, all the life that was lost in the flood, what happens to bodies? Like what would have happened to all these bodies? They, it, it, yeah, like, this just would have been a really hard event. And we know that Noah, uh, as I read it, like I noticed that one of the first things that Noah does after he gets off the boat, one of the very first things he does is plant a vineyard. Because I'm thinking to myself, this guy's shell-shocked, has some PSD, this dude needs a drink, right? That, that's how I'm reading and understanding Noah. He has just had one of the hardest moments that he can imagine. And so he just has, doesn't have a lot to say right now. But the other reason I think we might 
be understanding of Noah not having much to say about this commitment that God is making to, uh, to not use the flood, not use the waters against all the creatures and to put the bow up, right? Is to understand the other stories that are going on in the sort of the culture. Like there are two, there are stories that people are telling to make sense of how the world began. And here at the beginning of scripture, the way that we understand scripture in like the broadest sense is that scripture is the story of God revealing God's self to humanity over time. And this is at the beginning of the story. And over time, more and more will, will be explained and more and more will be understood so that by the end of, of, of the story of scripture, we can say things like we know God to be known at best known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace. Like, we can say these things. But here at the beginning of Scripture, all Noah really has to go on is that God created. And there are other stories running around about God who, who creates. Let me tell you the very short versions uh, of two other stories that would have been being told in sort of uh, that culture in that time. Like one story comes from Babylon, the, the Babylonian story, off to sort of the northeast of where Noah was, I believe. Um, the Babylonian story of how creation begins is that it is a fight between Marduk and Tiamat. And Marduk, the guy, kills Tiamat, the, the woman, these are a male and a female god, and, and by using a bone arrow, right? And so Marduk uses a bone arrow and kills Tiamat, the female god, and, and rips her body in half and uses one half of her body to form the sky, the other half of her body to form the, the land, and then uses this threat of violence to get all the other gods to subjugate themselves to Marduk. And then humanity is created to serve the whims of the God. And so as a Babylonian, your understanding of why you exist is that the gods are violent and use the threat of force. The bow and arrow has been used to kill a God and you are walking on the corpse of that God, right? To do the will of that God or else that God will use violence against you, right? That's the Babylonian story of how creation begins. The, uh, it's called the Enuma Elish, if you want to go look up more details. So the, the Sumerian story of how uh, the creation begins, we call it the Atrahasis epic. I don't know what, we don't, I don't think we know what they would have called it in, in Sumer. But again, this is another ancient story from the Sumerian culture. This is their creation story, right? Their creation story is that there were the lesser gods and the greater gods. And the greater gods started telling the lesser gods, that uh, the lesser gods needed to do some work for the, for the greater gods. And they were about to come to blows over this, to have a divine war. And then they came to peace at the last second. And the greater gods and the lesser gods agreed that they would create humanity to do the work that neither of them wanted to do. And so they, they sacrificed the, the, one of the lesser gods. They all ganged up on one of the lesser gods and killed that god and created humanity out of the flesh and blood of that god so that humanity could be told what to do. And so like, this is kind of the, the cultural milieu that, that this sort of sense of how their understandings of God was that are around when Noah is hearing this, right? That, that gods use violence to get their ways and we are just like made from the ashes of gods to do the will of gods. We are subjugated to the gods. And it is just, just these like, they sound to us like these horrifying stories and, and, and they are. And, uh, and so for Noah to hear that God is going to commit to all that lives never to use violence again, to put the bow up. Like remembering the bow is what Marduk used to kill Tiamat. And God is, no, I'm going to put, put, the, put the bow up. They can tell those stories and you know, they can believe them to be true or not, whatever. I'm telling you, Noah, like I want you to know this. I want you to pass this down. That God has put the bow up and made a commitment to all that is and all that ever will be that you need not fear the flood ever. I wouldn't be surprised if Noah was frankly just too shocked by this to say anything because it wouldn't have made much sense to him at that moment. What this does though, we can see in retrospect, is it lays the groundwork of everything that follows, right? The, this 
commitment that Noah, that God makes to Noah and all of Noah's family and all of Noah's descendants is the precursor to then the point at which Abraham is offered a covenant. The relationship of, if you go to this, prom- if you go to this land that I'm going to send you to, I will make you a father of many nations. Right? If you go to this land, you'll, you'll be a father of many nations, and Abraham goes off. And then this, the, co- the, the covenant that uh, God and Moses make. Right? God makes this covenant to Moses that if this people that you're, you have led out of slavery, if this people follows the Torah, follows the teachings I'm giving you, starting with the Ten Commandments, I will give them the promised land. You follow Torah, I give you promised land. Right. And then David is offered a covenant. That's what after they get to the promised land and they have established a kingdom, and then David is offered a covenant. Covenant: You will be my son. You will follow and be the person who, who helps people follow and rules in my name and follows Torah, and I will make your lineage, your, your line, a line of kings. You, do, you are a king, a righteous king. Your line will continue. Again, this is covenant. I do this, you do that. And then the new covenant in following Jesus, that, that we, this is what we follow, right? The offer is made. You follow Jesus in this life. You follow Jesus in this, this life, and your life will be transformed now. And there's a hope that we hold on to, a faith in a life that is to come, in the kingdom that is to come. All, right? all these covenants, they all begin with Noah. And notice how all of the covenants that follow have a, each party has something to do. But in this Noah covenant, the very first covenant, it's just an offer. Like God isn't asking anything of Noah. God is just offering. I want you to know before we do anything else, before any, before Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, before anything else, before we have those covenants, you need to know I'm not going to pick up the bow and destroy the earth. I'm I'm putting the bow up. I'm not going to use violence. This is is the start that all all that follows, that God is not going to be angry or vindictive. Yes, violence does happen, but it doesn't happen because God chooses. It happens because we, in general, choose. That's our choice. And we can see, as people who see the whole story uh, of, of Scripture, we see that in the end it's following the Prince of Peace, who, like, the bow never gets taken back down. Like, Jesus forsakes violence and, and leads us as, as the Prince of Peace. This is far beyond what Noah could have known, but this is where it all begins. This rings true to me, uh, especially as someone who follows, a Christian, follows Jesus, a, a, a Christianity that is rooted in, in the teachings of John Wesley. Uh, the Methodist Church, John, John Wesley, the way he taught us, is he has three simple rules, three general rules. If you want to be a Methodist Christian, if you want to use the methodical way of following Jesus, John Wesley lays out three rules. They're rather simple. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. That's it, right? And once you've heard them, you're probably not going to forget them. Do no harm, stay, uh, do what good you can, stay in love with God. And it was... Up until looking at this passage, I admit that I had kind of struggled with the ordering at times. Why do we start with do no harm? But looking at how this works today, right? Before God can get into any of the covenants of doing good down the road, first you got to start with Noah. Do no harm. Put the bow up. I'm not going to make it worse. Right? That's the commitment that uh, God makes in this, this, uh, this, what we're reading with Noah today. And it's still true for us today, right? This idea that as we who follow Jesus, that we put the bow up, we we stop making it worse, we make it crystal clear that when the followers of Jesus shows up, that's a good thing, right? That the followers of Jesus to arrive, for us to show up, that is a good thing. And if it's ever not a good thing, it's ever perceived as not being a good thing, that we back up, and that's what we have to grapple with. And as a church, we are a group of people who are excited to do things. We're excited to serve. We're excited to share what we have. We're excited to help people. That's what we're excited to do. We're excited to do the good that we can. And that's a great second rule, right? But we got to get to the first one first. Do no harm, then do good, and stay in love with God. And so as a church, I think it's important to acknowledge this at times and just ponder what that means for us. What is it to put the bow up 
and to know that to do no harm and to do so in a way that is as obvious and as clear as the, the bow is in the sky after the rain. How do we live as followers of Jesus such that when we show up and we say the church is, is here, that it is crystal clear that we're not there to do any harm. We're there to, to, to do good. And if that is at all confused, if people have any sense that we're there and that we're there is going to be is a bad thing, that we, we, we could do harm or cause problems, that that is the sign that it's not time to launch ourselves into doing good, it's time to stop and to very visibly do no harm and to listen and to make sense of the situation until we can then go on and start helping and serving in the ways that, that we want to do. I hope that uh, we can do that together. Amen.